Hello everyone, this is Masood Dramandi. I'm back with uh, another session of the Newman series, almost at the end of this series. It's been amazing with uh, all the concepts that we have been discovering uh, concerning the life of the new man, everything from uh, living from the spirit to the point of overcoming the old and everything in between. Uh, but today um, I'm shifting toward uh, basically our uh, true identity as a spirit. Um, I think in the last week's message I covered the fact that or the truth that um, basically we always go back up until the cross and nothing beyond that and that's when we actually see the old man dead. That's where actually all things uh, change. We begin to uh, basically quickly see the work of God in Christ uh, believe it, receive it, start living the new life after that. Not to see ourselves with the same old lens, but actually because now God has given us new sight, new eyes, new revelation, new perception, then we live this one. But where, <clears throat> when we say uh, we go back to the cross, we, when we say that's where actually the separation of the old and the new starts and the life of the new man begins, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 gives us a bit more, um, basically, uh, context to this, a bit more understanding, so we can um, perhaps use this uh, consciously in our life day to day and uh, live based on that. As I said, it's about our identity as the Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is about resurrection. It starts with resurrection, it continues with resurrection, it ends with resurrection. It starts by Paul questioning those who question resurrection, who say there is no such thing as resurrection. And he says, well, if you don't believe in resurrection, then uh, what would you say about uh, basically the resurrection of Jesus first and form foremost from the dead? If you don't believe those stuff, uh, if you don't believe that he, uh, basically there, <clears throat> there is a resurrection, you're kind of saying that you don't even believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So it starts from there. And then he argues that, well, it was according to the scripture. It wasn't that um, it came out of nowhere. No, it was written about, but then we saw it. I mean, the apostles, the 12 uh, apostles saw the resurrection. Then he appeared uh, to the, even 500 after resurrection at once. And even from then, many people have seen the one who was once dead. So he argues about the whole thing about the resurrection. Then he goes on to say, well, this is a big mystery. This is not now about the resurrection of one man from the dead. This is about resurrection of um, multitudes in Christ. That's where he begins to talk about uh, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So that's where actually he goes beyond one man's resurrection into everyone's resurrection. Then he begins to say that now some people would say, oh, with what body uh, the dead would come or in what body the dead would be raised. So I'm giving you the context because, I mean, that's not the subject. You're not going to be spending time on that. I, I want you to say, lay the foundation so you see where we are coming from. So where we get to the story of that you are a spirit, then that makes more sense. Anyways, so he says, people say, then if there is a resurrection with what body they would come. Then he goes on to um, basically give us an analogy. And by that analogy, um, he tries to show us how the old becomes the new, okay? And that's where he begins to talk about uh, basically a seed that is sown. So he says, when you sow a seed, it does not come to life unless first it dies. Now, I think everybody knows this, and you plant a seed on the ground, you don't expect a big seed to come out of the ground, right? You, what you expect is a tree or a plant to come out uh, of basically the earth. Uh, so then he goes on to say that therefore you don't plant that which you want to be. You don't plant a plant. You don't plant a tree. You plant a seed. And then out of that seed, because a death happens, the, the, the shell yeah, is broken from within something else comes out. Then he goes on to say, oh, so is the res resurrection of the dead. 
it, uh, what you sow is not what you want. What you sow is basically what you are. And then out of that, something comes. So that means from the old, coming to a place of death, then something new would come out. Now, let's continue. Let's actually start reading some scriptures um, in chapter 15 after all of... Basically, I gave, gave you almost 40 uh, verse of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm going to pick up from um, verse... Let's read from verse... 39. Okay, he says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, heavenly bodies, and uh, terrestrial bodies, earthly bodies, so heavenly and earthly bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of uh, terrestrial is another there is one glory of the sun and another of the moon and another glory of the stars and one star differs from another star in glory so he says look at the animal kingdom look at the elements of the heavenlies and look at even uh, basically uh, humans so all of them have a body but their the bodies differ they are different so the body of a fish is different than the body of um, basically the sun and the moon and it's different than the body of a human body uh, and he says well because there are different types of bodies now look at verse 42 so also is the resurrection of the dead see all of that was used to bring us to the story of resurrection and resurrection is where we see the new man that's what we're talking about the body is sown in corruption it is raised in incorruption so <clears throat> sown but then raised but then it's the the context is death and resurrection so when we say uh, the body is sown in corruption that means it is it dies in corruption and it is raised, resurrected, in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So what is he trying to say? Well, there is a change. Okay, so the resurrection is all about that. And the change happens this way. One dies, and out of that death, something new comes out. Look at verse um, 44. It is sown constantly, sown, raised, sown, raised, sown, raised. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. The word natural uh, is, in the Greek, means soulish. So it says, it is sown a soulish body, it is raised a spiritual body. Soulish versus spiritual, soul versus spirit, a body that is soulish versus a body that is spiritual okay so we're going to understand what that means there is a natural body once again a soulish body and there is a spiritual body and so it is written now this is the whole point i, I said all of this to come to this place the first man adam became a living being now the word being is soul so it says the first man adam became it is written in genesis chapter 2 i think verse 7 that the first man adam became and man became a living soul okay so remember we're talking about soulish and spiritual but the first man was um, basically a soul uh, the last adam became okay so we the last adam i've covered this before but jesus is the last of the generation of um, adam Okay, so he's, there is no, basically, any Adam after him. So the race of Adam ends with Jesus. Because clearly it says he's the last Adam. It doesn't say that there are more Adams after him. This is very key. So anyways, it says that the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay, 
So there was one that was a living soul, the first man, Adam. But then the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay, a life-giving spirit, a soul and a spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. Did really Jesus become a spirit? I mean, did he become spooky that he, there was no body or all of that? Obviously not. What happened then? He was raised in a body and that body is a spiritual. Okay, let me say it again. Jesus, when, when we say the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, you're not talking about him losing the body. Okay, something changed from a soul to the spirit. Now, this is the key. It says, when we say the life-giving spirit, the word life-giving is actually a verb in the Greek. Uh, it's not adjective, it's verb. Uh, and that means simply uh, that which makes alive, that which gives life. So this is actually a better translation. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a spirit that gives life. A spirit that gives life. A spirit that makes alive. Same thing. Spirit that makes alive. Or the spirit that um, gives life. Why this is important? Well, because of this. When you are a soul, okay? When you are a soul, you are a consumer. When you are a spirit, you are a giver. You are a producer. You are a generator. That's the difference between the two. A soul always um, worries about what he needs. And he tries to basically gain. And that's why he goes into labor. The spirit knows that he is the source of all things. He is the creator. He is the generator. He's the producer. Okay? That's the difference. Now... <clears throat> The context of resurrection, and now in the context of the new man, was to bring us out of a place of knowing ourselves as a soul that needs to consume, that lacks, to a place of knowing the sufficiency and abundance that it has, or it rather is. Okay? The spirit is life. I think we know... Um, some scriptures that Jesus talked about concerning uh, basically this, that the spirit is life. We're going to look at a couple of them. So see, uh, how many times have you been thinking that you are a spirit and you have or you are life? I think not often. Um, not, it's not like our consciousness always. Rather, what we think of is that we are a soul. Now, we don't think that, okay, I'm, whether I'm a soul or I'm a spirit, we don't switch between the two. We don't think about that. But the way we think actually determines whether we are living as a soul or we are living as a spirit. The soul always worries. Now, remember I talked about uh, basically casting your cares upon him. He's the shepherd of your soul and therefore cast your cares upon him. Otherwise, you will be devoured, all of that. So, Jesus talked about this. He says, he said, why do you worry or why do you take cares upon yourself saying, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I put on? That's all the mentality of a consumer. Okay. And when we are in that mood of consuming, um, because there is a need to uh, satisfy the needs, the desires of that soul, you will always be in labor, okay? Uh, and that means even the times that you don't necessarily need even something, but you will still be in, in, a, um, in a laboring uh, mood and you are thinking that way, you are operating that way, you are not that, I mean, you shouldn't be thinking about things. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. You can do things out of the spirit. Now, <clears throat> it says, this last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And I said, a better translation is that the last Adam became a spirit that gives life. Now, 
the moment you hear the word give life, I think uh, the most, uh, the verse that you have heard the most that has this one term in it, giving life, that gives life, is Romans chapter 8. And I think it should be verse 11. Let's look at that um, and see what the same author um, that has written both 1 Corinthians and Romans, what he says about giving life, since he is the one that uses this term. This is, yeah, in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 8 of the book of Romans. Look at uh, verse 10 first and if Christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life see I told you the spirit is life the spirit is the source of life the spirit is not the consumer of life the spirit doesn't seek life the spirit gives life so it says the body is dead but then the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay, so dead, uh, who, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies. Give life give life okay so he gives life to the body but who is he he says through the spirit and who is this that is in you it's not only christ it's not only god it's not i mean like you don't exist in that place because um he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him so <clears throat> it's this it's your spirit with his spirit in oneness that actually are doing this that give life to the body. Otherwise, if it was just God and this was true, that that spirit gives life just automatically, then everybody would be having the same amount of life and everybody would live according to the same life. But you don't see that, right? Now, the same uh, chapter, chapter 8 of the book of Romans, later talks about the spirit. Uh, basically, it comes to our help. So you see, that's where we begin to realize, again, there is a connection, there is a union between the two, and there is a co-labor, not the bad type of labor, uh, the good type of la labor. It's where actually you are connected, joined to the spirit, and you know the will of the spirit, and you do that. So that's when you actually are raised into the consciousness that I am a spirit. And I am the spirit that gives life. See, whenever you stand in front of a natural mirror, what you see is the natural man, is the soulish man. That's how we have seen ourselves. That's why the Bible speaks of the inner man that is now, that inner man is growing inside. How? Because now we are realizing that we are connected to a spirit. In fact, we are that spirit. So the moment that changes, how does that affect my daily life? How, does, how is that going to affect your daily life? Well, guess what happens when you switch between a place of a victim to a place of a victor? That's the difference. I mean, Romans 8 after that talks about us being more than a conqueror. The word is also overcomer. How? How are we? I mean, I don't, again, we don't always feel that way. Why? Because usually uh, it's not, again, we are not thinking about who I am as the spirit. You're still uh, living the life of a soul, expecting a spirit kind of life. And it doesn't work that way. It's where um, the, the change that needs to happen is to come out of the, the shell of flesh and realize that's not who I am. I'm not a flesh. I'm not a flesh and blood. I'm not, um, you know, a mere human being. I'm spirit. I'm a spirit. And that means I give life. I make a life. Okay. See, these are not um, based on our works and these are not things to brag about or, you know, talk about it often um, just to talk. No, these are the truths that, that are written. This is like 
um, what Paul says in chapter 8, I just read for you, verse 10. He said, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay, what does it mean? Because God has uh, preached to me the truth that I am one with him and I have believed that I have, I've, I've raised my consciousness that I am righteous, that I am the mirror image of God. And because of that, I'm taking a new image upon myself. And he says, that's the spirit. And that spirit is life. So spirit is life because of righteousness. That's what it means. Now, this is the image of uh, this spirit is the image of the second man. Let me show you this in 1 Corinthians um, 15, because that's where Paul actually continues um, in verse 47, 45 again. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit or a spirit that gives life. Verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual natural spiritual so the first man was of the earth made of dust the second man is the lord from heaven oh so it's all about the lord and his resurrection wait a minute let's continue as was the man of dust so also are those who are made of dust what does that mean it's not only about the first uh, adam it's about everybody that was made in the likeness of that Adam, in the image of that Adam. That's why he says, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. Those. Now, this is like a multitude. So, let's continue. And as is the heavenly man, who was the heavenly man? The Lord from heaven. So also are those who are heavenly. So, it's not again one, it's those. It's many. So, this uh, story of... Uh, being this second man that was not the first but the second that it was not first natural but it's actually spiritual this is about all of us now in verse 49 he says and as we have borne the image of the man of dust we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man okay so he says you have borne the image of the man of dust what does that mean oh look at what he says the man of dust is verse 50 now i say this brethren that flesh and blood okay why would he change suddenly from man of dust and heavenly man to flesh and blood well because he's going step by step and he's telling us what man of dust means flesh and blood a man whose identity is flesh and blood so it says verse 50 now this i say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god so now you understand An identity born out of flesh and blood cannot inherit why because the air is not according to flesh and blood the air is according to the promise is the child of the spirit i think we, we kind of have exhausted this story of Abraham with two wives um, that Isaac was the child of the promise and it's really the child of the spirit symbolically and um, uh, Ishmael was the child of the flesh so it wasn't according to promise it was according to the work of man according to uh, Abraham's labor not in faith not according to the spirit but in his labor according to the flesh so it says just like that that he he wouldn't be the heir the child of the spirit would be the heir in this sense also he says it's not the flesh and blood that actually is the heir now when the flesh and blood tries to achieve that which belongs to the spirit he will be frustrated and he will be exhausted and i think that's what happens soulish living which is according to flesh and blood uh, brings us to a place that we try to receive but the way that we do it is by works it's not the inheritance okay it says because flesh and flesh and blood is not the heir but then uh, we know that the heir according to what we are reading is the second man is the spiritual man is the man that is not according to flesh and blood it's according to the spirit so remember when you fall into traps and uh, you want to get out of it, the first thing that you must do is to realize, are you a soul or are you a spirit? Are you a consumer 
or are you a generator? I think we see these examples in the life of Jesus. Was Jesus a consumer? No. He was always a producer. Did he ever need to be ministered to? No. But did he minister always? Yes. Did he need to receive bread? No. But did he produce uh, bread out of nothing? Yes, he did. Did he need life? No. But did he give life in, in the sense of even physical healing? Yes, he did. So all of that was because he knew that he is a life-giving spirit. He's a spirit that gives life. Now, this might create confusion, saying people would think that, oh, so you said it, it comes only after resurrection. Um, so Jesus was not raised yet, so he didn't operate that way. See, the Bible is not to be... <clears throat> How do I say this? Um, I think this is, this is the difference between being under the law and being led by the spirit being under the law is all about give me one thing that always works and let me just go and do it so tell me what should i do and then okay the the, the thing is um you know you receive an instruction um we in fact had this happen uh recently that you say this is the email that should be sent out okay this is but then you say this is an example of what it should look like and then um, one of our staff actually took that email and sent it exactly I mean the second time that something similar happened sent it the same exact way not recognizing that there was a need for a bit of tweak to that first template so uh, she actually sent it out just the same way that we had given and this is living under the law you think always you know very um how do i say this rigid you don't think you don't you know get the spirit of um, the instruction you're in the formula of that instruction there is a bit of change and need so now when it comes to what i said about jesus um everything is written for our sake so we know he was God and he, because the same argue can happen. Well, was he God? I mean, then you say he's a man. How can he be both God and man? So it's the same thing when we say things about resurrection. These are all written for us that we may uh, understand. There, there is the whole thing about uh, the life of Jesus shows in multiple levels uh, the truth. So you're not to take, you know, one portion of the scripture and find contradiction with other one it's not a contradiction um it's just paying attention to the context and understand what uh the spirit of god is trying to show us anyways i think that would be it for uh this message so going back to uh one point that i want you to take uh from this and meditate on that because obviously this is something that needs a bit of you know focus uh and consciously remembering which is uh, you are a spirit okay it's simple but it's true you are a spirit and you're a spirit not only a spirit you're a spirit that makes a life you're a spirit that gives life now the question is how well you know the laws of the spirit and the laws of the flesh are completely different uh, and it's not the spirit has that authority that power the spirit is in a higher realm it has rule over uh, the natural realm so we may not understand the totality of it but we know that actually it works we know that it has worked in our lives in other people's lives in the gospels so but more awareness of this uh, i think that the holy spirit even would lead each of us individually into what it looks like and um, how to get deeper in this but Please uh, meditate on this, that I am a spirit that gives life. I hope this was helpful. I'll see you in the next week's message.